Keep on the sunny side, always on the sunny side. Keep on the sunny side of life. It will help us every day. It will brighten all the way. If you keep on the sunny side of life. Hi, this is Joe Martin. I'm the pastor at First Baptist Church in Toledo, Washington. Thank you for taking a few moments to to watch this midweek video. You know we're we're living in a time of extremism. Passionate people, sincere people, oftentimes have being have been radicalized all over the place, and and um, into destructive heresies and this is not this is across the world and in our country too these movements have risen down through history and then collapsed and come back in some uh, new version you know um we're heading toward a uh the holiday where we celebrate our country's founding so you think about that, you think about some of the things that you see, not just in America, but across the world, when love of country is radicalized into nationalistic fervor. Oftentimes great destruction, great violence can follow that. We don't have to go very far back into the history of our world to see how in the 20th century, and that's just scratching the surface, in the 20th century we saw where the imperial Japanese in their nationalistic rise in the uh, early part of the 20th century opened up into a, a militaristic expansion that resulted in World War II, along with the uh, rise of Mussolini and other fascist powers. These were all rooted in kind of a, a um, almost religious type of nationalism. And religious nationalism is, that is like very specific, is still very much in the mix around the world. The mixing of religion with the power of the state has brought a slaughterhouse of horrors across the centuries. As a matter of fact, many of the people that fr from Europe that came to North America came initially because they were trying to move away from that kind of state power imposing the religious will. Sadly, unfortunately, the uh, oppressed sometimes become the oppressors and that can, that happened on some level here in the early colonies. But across the centuries, this has played out. It's risen and gone back down. In, in you go back a little further to the 30 year war in Germany where uh, the Catholic princes, uh, backed by the uh, emperor and the pope on one side, and then the Lutheran Protestant princes on the other fought this pitched battle for territory, for control. Uh, these were terrible things that happened. Um, even in our country where we look back and we think um, of the violent conquests sometimes done and oftentimes almost exclusively done in incredibly um, cruel ways of indigenous people. And that was, you know, sometimes you forget that that was rooted oftentimes in the baseline of a type of um, religious nationalism, citing the doctrine of discovery that went all the way back to the late 1400s where um, the Pope declared anybody who wasn't following their particular religion was subject to have anything done to them that they wanted. Later on, as you learned like I did when we were kids with Manifest Destiny, uh, where all kinds of things were justified, um, saying ultimately God was on our side. The Armenian Genocide happened a hundred years ago, where um, the Ottoman Turkish Empire 
um, uh, slaughtered the Armenian Christians surrounding the, the intrigues of World War I. The rise of the Nazi party happened later, oftentimes with the full cooperation of the Church of Germany. We've seen it in our era during the, um, our own experience in our own lifetimes, the rise of the Taliban and the Taliban beginning to rise again in Afghanistan, where they're imposing under the power of the state Islamic law, Wahhabism. It's rising in Hindu nationalism in India, um, where you have this welding of the state power with religious power, and even Christian nationalism is on the rise. It's rising again in the U.S. It's really well intended, but it's a false teaching that um, that somehow uh, the United States of America is the new Israel, um, and all kinds of scriptures are taken out of context to justify that. That we are now God's as a as a nation state, as a modern nation state, we are God's chosen nation. There's nothing in scripture to validate that. Nothing really in the history of the church to validate that. Something that is clearly rejected um, by any, any honest reflection on what scripture teaches. And even why, um, when we think about the reality of the world, that the vast majority of Christians around the world don't live in America. And yet, as we approach this national holiday, let's talk about the word that really matters. Not all of this kind of conflict and anger and, and postulating about um, nationalism. Let's talk about something that gets forgotten in the midst of these controversies. Let's talk about two, two words this week. First word will be tonight, and then, then on the weekend, we'll talk a little bit more, and that is being a citizen and the citizenship that goes with it. Tonight, I don't want to talk to you about that word citizen. That first word citizen is so important. As a follower of Jesus, for you, as you follow Jesus, what does it mean for you to be a citizen in America, in your town, in the local place? Oftentimes we think of this as this big, you know, it's so far removed. But the politics that really matter are the politics of your family and your local life and your local community. You know, it's interesting when I use the word politics because the word citizen, citizen comes from the word politia, politia, where we get the word politic. Uh, uh, to be, um, sometimes it's the word uh, that it just means like brotherhood, but it is this idea of politia. And what does that even mean? Well, what does it mean to live in this relationship with one another, this idea of a human community. What does it mean to be a good citizen? As a Christian, especially, how do you live as a good citizen in America? Well, first of all, you must start by starting with this idea that you are under the ultimate authority. You have to remember that if you are a Christian, you are under the ultimate authority. Remember what Paul said? He said in Philippians 3.20, for our citizenship is in heaven. He said, you know, you're first a citizen of heaven. And then he says, and this is what you do when you wait, when you are living under that ultimate authority. Our citizenship is in heaven, for from which also we eagerly wait for a savior the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what that means? That means above all these other things, all these other people that are trying to get us stirred up about this thing or that thing and the politia of our era is that our first citizen relationship is in heaven. It is in our relationship with believers, with one another from which we eagerly wait for a savior. Do you know all the stuff that we're, the stuff that we're all fired up about, how much of it is gonna really matter when Jesus comes back? Because that's what we're to be looking for. That's what we're to be gauging things on. That's why the Bible says, you know, that first place in your Christian experience is that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. You know, that verse is a, is a, a refrain to push back against the pressure of the Roman state 
to make Christians declare that Caesar was Lord. And what Paul was saying, to really be a citizen, you have to start with confessing that above everybody else, Jesus is God. He is the Lord. Not the emperor, not the president, not um, anybody. Nobody should take that role. And you should not allow anyone to do so. You confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. You're believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead. For confession is made. You call upon his name. This is so important. And that's why it says in Romans 14, 1, it says, read it for yourselves in scripture. As I live and breathe, God says, every knee will bow before me and every tongue will tell the honest truth that I and I only am God and Lord. That's where we start. You know, you're the first step of really being a good citizen is to be under that authority. You know, and that that's why I you know that's what makes a good citizen because you know I'm not going to treat you bad. I I'm not I don't want to treat you bad. Why? Because you have value with God. You have value with God. You were created equal before God. You were. And so I need to treat you with a level of respect even if I don't agree with you. I can't turn you into the the absolute enemy because you see I'm under authority of the one that I'll stand before and I'll give an account for the second thing is you know the second thing you need to remember if you were going to be a good citizen you are under orders that's right remember that the orders that we are um, supposed to be focused on you know we're not supposed to be focused on the news or the polls or whatever the next election is here's what we're supposed to be focused on in everything therefore treat people the same way you want them to treat you for this is the law and the prophets that's what matthew 7 12 says you know he doesn't say anything about owning the other political side or those terrible people that we label one way or the other he says in everything you do your words your actions your giving your serving your treatment your your statements, everything. In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you. For this is the law and the prophets. This is everything. You are under orders to do that. This is not a suggestion. This is the golden rule we've come to know. Think about what a great place. Think about how much difference it would make in the world. In your world, in my world, in our country, if we took this serious that in everything we're going to treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophecy. You say, well, that's not, pra- that's not practical. You know what? Serving God isn't practical. Love isn't practical. But, oh, it makes all the difference in the world, doesn't it? And then Jesus said in Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven, 37, you're under orders. And he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And this is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Of these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. You know what he says? You and I are under authority. He's our Lord. But you're also under orders. You are to love God with everything in your being. And you are to love your neighbor as yourself. Are you doing that? That's how you're a good citizen. So why do I have to love my neighbor as myself? Well, because I love God, and he told me to. <laughs> if you love him, you'll keep his commandments. You see, being a neighbor, and, and I know what you could say, because that's what I would say too. Well, who's my neighbor then? Somebody asked Jesus that too. And Jesus said, well, he told the story of the Good Samaritan. The Samaritans, they, the, the people he was talking to, the conservative religious crowd, of Jewish crowd, they hated Samaritans. They were different from them politically. They were different from them nationally. They were different from them. They had a different uh, uh, ethnic heritage than them. They had a different culture. They had a different religion. And Jesus told the story about that the hero of the story was the Good Samaritan that helped the poor Jewish man that had been neglected and 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 um, dismissed by his own people by a Levite and a scribe or a Levite and a priest on their way um, back from the temple. Jesus said the hero of the story was a Samaritan. 
you know, Jesus was trying to teach us something here. You know who your neighbor is? Your neighbor is the person that's right there with you. They can be people you differ with culturally. They can be different. They, they can vote differently. You. They can have different opinions about things. They can be different religiously or politically. You are to love your neighbor as yourself. Oh, what a country we could have. What a, what a town, what a community. What families we could have if we would be, we would not only be under authority, but we would be under orders and take it seriously. You know, Paul applies this. He's not, he doesn't say, well, this was just some ideal that Jesus brought out. G Paul said in Galatians 6, 9, he says, let us not. And, and it's easy to get discouraged, isn't it? In times like this, you see people doing crazy things and politicians doing crazy things on one side or the other. But Paul said, let us not lose heart in doing good. You do good. For in due time, we will reap if we do not grow weary. And then he says this. He says, where do you do good? Galatians 6.10. So while we have opportunity, and by the way, if you're alive, you have opportunity. If you still have money in the bank, you have opportunity. If you have breath in your lungs, you have opportunity. So then while we have opportunity, let us do good. Listen, let us do good to all people, all people, everybody and especially to those who are in the household of faith. You know what he's saying? All those people around you, you don't just do it just for the Christian friends that you have. You do it for all people, but especially for your Christian friends. Let's work on being a citizen. Being a citizen who is under authority. He's the Lord. And being a citizen who remembers that we are under orders. This isn't up for discussion. We love him. We're going to keep his commandments. I can't wait to talk to you more about citizenship. That's what it means to be a citizen. You are under authority and under orders. But citizenship, oh, it has much, much more meaning. God bless you. And I can't wait to see you or talk to you more on the weekend.